Cloud. I run the Cloud Institute for Sustainability Education, and I have the pleasure of introducing Shie Bastida. Um, you can Google her. Um, you'll get a lot of information about her. Uh, as we were just joking, nothing is sacred anymore on the internet. Um, and if you did Google her, you could find many things about her. She's a Mexican, Chilean climate activist. She belongs to the Otomi Toltec Nation. Um, she was a young teenager when she started this work. She went to Beacon High School and is now at UPenn and will be 20 soon this month on her birthday. Uh, she was a great organizer of the Fridays for Future movement uh, where students all over the world actually, she was in New York City at the time, but organized there and, and prompted many students from around the world to, um, to march on Fridays uh, for climate. She is a member of the People's Climate Movement Committee, the Re-Earth Initiative. She won the Spirit of the UN Award or was re um, uh, received the Spirit of the UN uh, Award when she was 16 years old in 2018. And she's now running a youth activism training program, which I know she's going to talk about today. And um, if you are an Instagram person, she has 52,000 followers, which is pretty impressive. Um, so you could get all that on the internet. What you might not be able to, to see or what I know you won't be able to see on the internet is that I met her and her mom, Geraldine, a few years ago at the Omega Institute. And there were a few youth leaders there at the, at the conference we had for Drawdown Learn. Uh, Drawdown is how we're gonna draw down the CO2, 80% of the CO2 um, in the atmosphere uh, relatively soon. Um, and you can all look that up. And I asked Xie uh, and several of her colleagues, please tell me that something you learned in school had something to do with your leadership in this area. And they all said no, that they brought climate literacy to their schools. And it broke my heart. And it was one of the reasons why we started the center. Many of us, we all have our own reason for contributing to the start of the Center for Sustainability and Climate Education, but that was mine. And without further ado, Shie Bastida. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, and hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. And for those who are watching this later on, thank you for watching this. Uh, so my name is Shia Bastida and today I'm going to share my story along with what I think you can do to be socially impactful as a young person. So I will be sharing my screen um, so we can get started. So um, I think we're all here. <clears throat> Sorry, I apologize for my voice. I think we're all here because we know that the climate crisis is an issue that hasn't been paid attention to. Um, the global temperatures are rising faster than ever, and we are on our way to above 1.1 degrees of warming from pre-industrial levels. Usually, the climate crisis has been framed to us as an issue of polar bears in the Arctic or an issue of, of plastic pollution, an issue of using straws. And these frames basically tell us subconsciously that the climate crisis is too far away and that the solution to it is individual actions like recycling. They take away the fact that it's happening right now. They take away the fact that we not only need to engage ourselves in individual action, but also systemic change. And I was, you know, I grew up looking at this and I grew up knowing that um, most of the things that I knew about climate change, which is what it was called before we started using climate crisis, was things that were very separated from us as people, separated from us in terms of touching our hearts and touching our culture. And so um, this is my town in Mexico, San Pedro Tultepec in 2015. This right here is my mom. And I think that this moment when I was 13 years old, when my hometown flooded for the first time, it showed me that the climate crisis was already here. It showed me that we didn't have to wait till the end of the century to see effects. It showed me most importantly that the climate crisis did hit 
poor towns, frontline communities, and smaller communities, the harshest. After this, I realized, you know, we don't really have the infrastructure in my town to deal with flooding. All of the talks about mitigation and adaptation that go on at the UN don't reach small towns around the world and even big cities around the world. Um, I didn't need to look at a picture of a polar bear struggling to stay afloat when that was happening in my own hometown. And the most important thing, the most important thing is that, you know, my parents, they both studied sustainable development. They had both been activists way before I was born. They met in 1992 at the first Earth Summit. And I grew up about, with them talking about the climate crisis my whole life. And even then, I didn't know that it could hit me. And this was the only form in which the climate crisis hit my home. This is El Rio Lerma, which is, goes right by my town. And it's one of the most polluted rivers in Mexico. And this is the train that was built uh, from Toluca to Mexico City and has a station on my town. I realized that a lot of things um, were the climate crisis, not only the floods and wildfires that we usually see labeled as climate crisis, but also plastic pollution, disproportionate pollution in certain towns, disproportionate infrastructure that doesn't, um, harmful infrastructure that doesn't take into account people in uh, in its development. So this train was built on top of an aquifer that we had where, you know, it was bursting with life. And we, my mom and I used to drive by there and hear the, you know, the frogs and hear all of the wildlife. And all of a sudden it was just blocked with cement. And, you know, this is when you start to realize that everything is connected, that the fact that my town is small and low income and next to Mexico City makes it a target for a lot of infrastructure and a lot of pollution that would not be put uh, in another place. And so after, um, the, actually the day after the flood uh, in my town, my family and I moved to, to New York City uh, because my parents had a job there and it just happened that the dates were exactly the same. And so I left my town without knowing how my town had recovered, how long the impacts of the flood were, how people were you know, coming back from their businesses being destroyed. And in New York City, I saw the impact that Hurricane Sandy had had. Uh, I wasn't there for Hurricane Sandy, but I saw how it had left Long Island with some parts completely destroyed. And I remember having seen this on the news. That is when my, build, my brain starts building this notion that the climate crisis is not specific to time, specific to, to a certain way of looking. It's happening all around the world and it, we're just feeling it in different ways. This brings me to the first time I ever got involved in any type of action. I went to the first, uh, my first conference was the Ninth World Urban Forum in Malaysia. I got here because my dad um, had been working, you know, as a speaker and bringing indigenous knowledge, which I'm going to talk about later, into different spaces. And he was invited to the World Urban Forum and he couldn't go. So at a time I was 15 years old and he said, you should go to Malaysia and speak. And so I flew to Malaysia by myself as a 15 year old and I got there and it was time for me to give my speech right away. I couldn't even prepare. And so I went on stage and I talked about the importance of indigenous knowledge. I talked about the fact that in my school, I had never been taught about climate change, except for that little paragraph in our history books that says climate change, is it happening or not? And so I talked about the disconnect that we had between youth learning about the climate crisis and you know, having, just having right to that information, the disconnect between what's going on and what we're learning. And the fact that most of the things that I knew were thanks to my parents and not thanks to the school systems. And at the end, everyone, you know, 
was shocked that a 15 year old was speaking up for something that had been not spoken up by youth for a very, very long time, or maybe at all. And so the World Urban Forum asked me to speak at two other different um, uh, panels in, in the whole conference. And that is when you realize that in the climate crisis, the voice of a youth is much more impactful than the voice of an adult person because the climate crisis is a generational issue. It's generational injustice. So my kids and my grandkids are gonna see the effects of the climate crisis in a much harsher way than current generations will. And so I decided I couldn't just stop at this one conference that I got to be part of. I had to keep growing with the information that I had, with the personal experiences that I had been gone that I had gone through. And so when I returned to New York City, I um, started getting involved with the environmental club. By then it had only been, I think for about two or three months. So I joined the environmental club right when it was starting. My question was, you know, how can I make an impact? And when there's so many things to do in the world and at the same time, so little ways of getting uh, involved, it's hard to pick how to, um, how to make yourself feel like you're having an impact, you know? So my answer was join your community and that community was my school. And so I joined the environmental club and I realized that just as I had been learning about the climate crisis, they were teaching it. We were talking about recycling, we were talking about oceans and plastic, but it was in a very superficial way, in a way in which we, our action pieces were bring a metal straw for a day or don't use plastic for a week. And I knew that we could do so much more. And I knew this because coming from Mexico, I knew how impactful New York City could be. I know that New York City is a global stage and whatever you do is gonna have a repercussion everywhere in the world, or at least that's how I saw it at the beginning. And then, you know, I told everybody, we know the statistics. We know that only 9% of plastic gets recycled. Recycling is not a way out of the climate crisis. You know, we know that, uh, we know that the city, you know, the way in which we could make best impact is we, we had a soft plastic ban, but nothing is really gonna change if we get our cafeteria to go plastic free, which we had been trying for a long time and it still hadn't happened. And I you know, told everybody, we need to do both. We need to change our school so this school can change other schools, but we also need to change the city and we need to change the state and we need to change the country. And that is when uh, we get started getting involved in um, things that were outside of school. In the picture on the right, we are in Albany lobbying for the CLCPA, the, the sorry, it changed the name so many times, uh, the Climate and Leadership Community Protection Act, the CLCPA, um, which back then, you know, had never passed the first stage uh, that a bill has to pass. And now we thankfully got the CLCPA passed, but we need to pass the CCIA, the Climate and the Climate Investment Act. This I should get these names, <laughs> uh, this acronym is straight. Um, so we need to pass the Climate Investment Act. But the point of this is that, you know, getting involved at the local level really shows you that youth in the city are not given the avenues to get involved. Uh, for many, many months, I was the only youth showing up to People's Climate Movement, which is the, um, the citywide coalition of climate organizations. And most people there were retired, so they had time to really focus on climate solutions, or maybe they were starting their own organizations or they were part of a UN organization, but there was no youth. And for many, many meetings, I was listening and writing down everything that they were saying and paying attention to the dynamics of where the movement was as this was the organization that had organized the People's Climate March in 2015. That was one of the biggest climate marches to have ever existed. 
And I was so excited to be among people who were so powerful and could organize so well. Um, but they always asked me, how do we get youth involved? And I didn't even know that question because I knew that caring about the climate crisis was something that was personal to me, but I wasn't sure that it was the same case for everyone else. And that's when, um, you know, that's when Greta Thunberg started to strike. That's when she started to go to her parliament and said, I'm not gonna go to school unless my, my, um, my city does something about the climate crisis. And when I heard about this, when I heard that she was planning the first global climate strike, I said, this is our opportunity as youth to show that we can come together and to show that we care about addressing the climate crisis, to show that this is something that is very important to us because I don't wanna grow up in a world where I'm scared of the future and a world in which people in power are not doing enough. And I organized uh, my school for the first ever global climate strike, um, which I'll find a picture too. Oh, this is another picture of me testifying outside of city hall uh, before the strike started happening. And this is the first climate strike. Um, we organized, you know, all of us organized our own schools. And out of our own schools, we got 5,000 kids to strike on March 15th. Obviously, that was nothing compared to the numbers that Germany was getting, for example, which was like 50,000 kids. So we fell pretty behind being in New York City, having over 600 high schools and only getting 5,000 students. But we knew that it was a start and it was a very powerful one. And for many times, many weeks, it was just a few people striking. Um, I, I was on strike almost every week outside of the United Nations. And I went, when I went to Mexico to visit family, I also did strikes in Mexico. This is Mexico City. And that's Viernes for el Futuro translates to Fridays for Future. So, you know, it was just about um, getting the momentum going or just showing up, showing up every week. And somebody once told me this, and I think it's so true, which is showing up is 50% of the work. Once you um, turn out to a place, once you bring yourself somewhere, everything else comes easier because you already did that effort of putting that time away in your calendar of saying, I'm gonna be there for whatever happens and I'm gonna bring my best intentions. And all of a sudden it turned out into a global movement where hundreds of thousands of youth were striking. The biggest strike I was ever um, part of organizing was the September 20th climate strike, which brought over 300,000 people to the streets of New York and over 7.4 million people around the world. And what was different about the strike was that we asked everyone to join us, not just youth. Our, our little saying was, you know, strike with us because we know that we cannot, uh, as youth, bring, you know, enough attention to change the world. It has to be everybody who cares about the future of youth, about the present of communities, about the present of what we are already going through. And so the question, arise. Once you have a movement, how do you sustain it? And this is where I'm going to talk about everything that I've learned in movement building so that you can join us in this fight, so that you can know what the best practices are to be a climate justice activist. The first thing that I will talk about uh, in this section is indigenous philosophy, which is something that I was raised with. I was raised in, as I said before, San Pedro Tultepec, and the community, original community there is the Otomi Toltec indigenous community. My name, Xie, actually means rain in Otomi, soft rain. And so I grew up with a set of morals that I realized were very different to what most people grew up with. My parents grew up, I mean, my parents raised me, um, teaching me about reciprocity which means that, yes, we take so much as humans. And the only thing we have to do is give back. 
that reciprocal relationship has to be present in our interpersonal relationships with us and our family, with us and our friends. But it also has to be present with our relationship with Mother Earth. We have to give back to Mother Earth. We have to nurture. That is our role here, to leave the world better than we found it. My parents also taught me about the seven generation principle, which says that every decision that we make has to be done with the wisdom of the past seven generations to ensure the stability of the future seven generations. This seven generation principle is actually very common uh, in indigenous communities across the world. And it's something that we have not been paying attention to. If you realize most of our economic system is based on quarter reports and on daily stock market rises and falls, we are not thinking long-term. We're definitely not thinking in seven generations long term. We're thinking of the next presidential race. We're thinking of the next, um, you know, the next board member for this company. We're not thinking of what it looks like to make our decisions with the future of our children in mind. The next point is intergenerational cooperation, which is a big part of why we decided that it was better to not put adults as enemies to youth movement, but actually as integral part of the success of the climate justice movement. But that only happens when we work together. In indigenous communities, there's something called youth and elder circles. Youth and elder circles are when um, youth and the elders in the community have talks together without the parents there, which allows us to exchange wisdom and energy. So we learn about the wisdom of our elders and our elders are invigorated by all of the you know, energy and vitality that we bring. And that is how you keep you know, the community going with knowledge. And we have lost a lot of that. We have lost um, talk, speaking with our elders, learning about our stories, learning about tradition, not only in the traditional way, in the community way, but also in every, um, in any big interaction that there is. When we see youth in, for example, talking to companies and when we see youth talking to politicians, it's usually as a way of tokenism, usually as a way of saying, we have a youth, so we're doing great. Instead of saying, how do we actually incorporate the things that this young person cares about into our policy? How do we make sure that the views of the future are included in our, in our decision-making or policy-making? And the last thing is community care. I think we all, through the COVID-19 pandemic, have realized the importance of taking care of yourself, the importance of having self-care routine, the importance of, um, you know, hanging out with your friends, the importance of slowing down, the importance of, you know, having um, that regenerative culture. But it's as important to take care of your community because I'm sure a lot of you have seen this, but a finger cannot do much and five fingers together can do a lot. And that is the same um, I, the same concept in community building, in community care, in movement building. Together, we are more powerful than we are alone. And yes, there are individuals who can inspire you and individuals that are doing amazing things, but everybody who's doing something amazing is able to get there because there's people alongside all of us. And so this brings me to intersectionality. We cannot forget that the climate crisis is about how things interconnect. And I think this diagram shows it really well. One side says the ice caps are melting and the other side says my daughter has asthma. You would see these two as completely unrelated to each other. But when they are together, they are about how the climate crisis actually is. If you think about it, the ice caps are melting because of rising fossil fuels the rising emission of fossil fuels. All of these fossil fuels are contaminants, they're pollutants, and they pollute our air. A lot of communities are suffering from higher rates of asthma because of these pollutants. So the things that are causing uh, the temperature to go up, the ice caps to melt, are the same things that are causing a lot of health issues in different communities around the world. 
For example, in the Bronx, 17% of adults have asthma, which is 10% higher than the national US average. And we're seeing the, the, all of these rates go up, the rates at which the ice cubes are melting, the rates at which people in polluting in communities that are polluted have asthma. And if we can see the intersection of how all of these seemingly unrelated things connect, that is when we can have real solutions. So we can target pollution and we can also tar target the emission of fossil fuels in a way that it, it doesn't compromise the other and make sure that communities keep being healthy. Um, another thing that I'll talk about is that just as you know, issues interconnect, they actually can overlap so much that they create something called an environmental justice community. An environmental justice community is not a community that necessarily fights for climate justice. It's just a community that is affected the most by something that can be labeled an environmental, uh, an environmental issue that has to do with the makeup of the community. So if we look at this diagram, it's a community of concern, um, overlap with absence of environmental and public health benefits, overlap with the presence of disproportionate environmental and public health stressors, that creates an environmental justice community. An example of this is, for example, is um, in New Orleans, they have the Ninth Ward, which is the community that got hit the hardest by, um, by Hurricane Katrina. That community is not a community of concern because that community uh, suffered a lot of stress from that hurricane. But it also has an absence of environmental and public health benefits because it's an underfunded community. It's primarily a black community. And so a lot of uh, regulations do not apply. And that's why we see things in New Orleans like Cancer Alley, which is basically this long stretch where there's so many factories that so many people have um, higher rates of, of cancer than, than most, most places around the country. And so then there's the presence of disproportionate uh, health stressors, which include things like uh, Levi's not working properly. And so, sorry, Levi's not working properly. So communities are more exposed to pollution and also- It's nine o'clock. And also things like fa the factories. And all of these things come together to cause a community that is under so many different stressors that is easily targeted um, by companies so that they are still polluted, so that there's an absence of regulations. And so this cycle continues. I think one of the biggest things that we learn, that we don't learn about the climate crisis is that solutions that are intersectional and solutions that take people into consideration have been proposed for over 30 years. Um, I'm gonna go back to this slide right here where uh, it shows us the principles of environmental justice. These are 17 principles of environmental justice that were drafted by people of color in 1991. Sometimes we struggle to come up with language that encompasses climate justice and encompasses what we want to see in today. We, we struggle to come up with our language today because we are not taught that the climate movement has been an environmental justice movement for over 30 years already. And just to go back to the other, to the slides we were at. And so that brings me now with all of this information that I have given you, um, I want to communicate to you 10 steps, 10 concrete steps to become a climate justice activist. Um, and a lot of these things are things that are gonna be uh, summarized from the presentation. And I think that these are very important so that we can take all of the, you know, in an era where we know more information than ever before, we have to be able to take that information and apply it. And especially for young people, we have, to be seen as people who can be socially impactful because we are the greatest you know, number of, of people in our generation that um, has never had the information that we have before. We have never 
uh, seeing and interaction, a generation that is so globally connected as before. And that means that we have so much power and leverage onto what happens with our future, what happens with our present. So these are the 10 steps to become a climate justice activist and I'll run um, through them pretty quickly. The first one is don't start from scratch. There are hundreds of existing initiatives that you can join. And I think that this is a very important one because a lot of the times we think that we have to come up with a new organization on, or a new thing, when in reality, there's hundreds of organizations that want volunteers, that want people to show up, that want people to, to help build you know, their movement. But if you cannot find a place that aligns with your values and a place that is doing exactly what you want, you're always welcome to start a chapter of Fridays for Future or a chapter in your school where you organize protests, where you are a liaison uh, between the student body and the administration. And that is, are things that are gonna build up so that you can organize bigger and better protests. Number two is to maintain good communication with your peers and the adult organizations that you partner with. This one is very important because the, the best thing we can do to have a successful action, a successful strike, a successful uh, protest is to maintain open communication. And with this, I mean, for example, Extinction Rebellion, which I don't know if you have heard of it, but Extinction Rebellion is this organization that engages in direct action. They usually block roads or you know, nonviolent direct action um, to, for the purpose of getting arrested. And most of these uh, people who get arrested are people who um, have the ability to get arrested. And by this, I mean, I couldn't be in that position where I put myself through arrest because I am an international student. I am not a permanent citizen of the United States. So if I get arrested, I am at higher chances of getting my visa taken away than any other repercussions that a US citizen could have. And that is why good communication is important because we have to be able to know who can do what, how, what are people's, you know, how, what are people comfortable with? And this is important to keep going, not only for when we plan actions, but when we create, uh, you know, campaigns and initiatives. Number three is to take good care of yourself and others. And I talked about this when I talked about community care, but this is so important because burning out as an activist is very easy. And by that, I mean that you're just doing so much, so many things at the same time that you forget to look after yourself. But it's important to keep in mind that we're doing this at the end of the day because we want to build joy. That is what we're protecting. We're protecting future generations' right to joy. We're protecting their right to not be faced with all of these climate catastrophes. And if we want to get to a point where joy is the thing that we're protecting, we have to practice it. And that goes by celebrating your wins. Uh, you have to you know, make sure that your movement is mirrors the world that you wanna live in. Um, and that basically means have fun when you organize, have fun in all of these different steps because trying to save the world is a very, very hard job and we cannot do it if we're not um, optimistic and if we don't believe that we can, you know, actually have an impact. Number four is to make your activism intersectional, include all stakeholders in your decision making and don't tokenize. Um, I think that we have seen examples of this in many instances, but a very clear one is when companies try to be more sustainable and they say, we're gonna have a youth member in our board to show that we care about the next generation. But most of the times that one youth person, um, one, that, that one young person, we cannot really work and talk about what youth care about if it's just one of us. And the company's probably doing it to tokenize us, to say we have this young person who is um, you know, represents our ideals as a company, instead of saying we're having an actual dialogue with 
multiple young people about what our company can do to be better. And by intersectional, I mean realizing that everything connects. And so every decision that we make and the policies that we push forward have to think not only about one goal, but how they impact multiple goals. Number five is that just for the sake of efficiency, don't do things the patriarchal way, the racist way, the exhausting way, or a way that excludes marginalized voices. And this one is very important because you have probably only heard of climate organizations such as Sierra Club or Greenpeace or you know, NRDC, they're really big ones that mainly focused uh, for the past 50 years on protecting national parks. That's probably what you know most about, um, about protecting the environment is protecting um, areas, protecting uh, oceans or protecting different um, places. And most of these protections have been enacted by pushing people away, by pushing indigenous communities out of their original place, by making sure that nature is kind of caged in instead of accessible to us in a, in a more mindful way. And so this is why we have to make sure that marginalized voices are never excluded um, because a way that you think that a park can be protected is very different from a way that the people who are there from there originally knows the park can be protected. Um, another example, I'm sure you've heard about carbon offsets, which basically mean that whenever you take an, a flight, for example, the, a company is gonna plant trees to cancel out the carbon that your flight emitted. A lot of the times these projects are done in places like the Amazon where companies buy off a piece of land and they plant trees there, um, but by that they are privatizing the land, they're pushing indigenous communities away. And a lot of the times they're not planting the trees that are from that ecosystem and that are gonna add to the biodiversity health of that ecosystem. So things have been, you know, offsetting or carbon sounds like a good idea because you're not having that impact. But if those trees are planted in a way that is not mindful, it's actually gonna hurt the planet more than help. Number six is that at events that you hold, invite indigenous peoples to do land acknowledgements. And remember that indigenous knowledge is a foundation for addressing the climate crisis. This one is very important to me because we have to remember that the people who have been taking care of mother earth for thousands of years are indigenous communities who have practices of, of that go hand in hand with protecting Mother Earth. And especially in the United States with so many native people pushed away from their territories. It's important that we address what indigenous land you're on. And in New York City, for example, we are on Lenape land. Number seven is to always convey that individual and structural change are both indisputably necessary. And this is when we go back to the talk of, should I recycle or should I go to city hall and advocate for for soft plastic to be banned. Sorry, um, yeah, and we need both of them. We need, we need people to stop using single use plastic and we need uh, all of that energy of individuals also going towards policy change and structural change because structural change is how you can make individual change available to everybody without everybody having to make that conscious decision of, of, of stopping the use of plastic. Number eight is to meet people where they're at. Not everybody knows the climate crisis back and forth. So whenever we talk about the climate crisis, we have to present solutions, present it in a way that is not only telling you how the world is uh, failing, but actually what we can do to help. And this this is the part where books like Drawdown are important because they talk about solutions. They talk about the future that is possible when we implement everything that we know about um, drawing down carbon and stopping the emission of carbon. Uh, number nine is to use accessible language. Not everyone knows uh, all of the jargon of the climate talks. For example, IPCC report means Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 
which is the panel that comes out with the reports that tell us how we're doing globally on climate. And the last one is to talk about greenwashing, environmental racism, green gentrification, and what an equitable transition means. When we talk about the climate crisis and when we talk about climate solutions, we cannot forget that the climate crisis is perpetuating a lot of the systems that are broken. That includes things like when a building is renovated and it has better insulation and it has solar panels on, uh, that building is going to be sold for a higher price, which means that low income people who lived in that building cannot afford the rent anymore, so they have to move out. If you displace communities with climate solutions, that is not an intersectional holistic policy. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of greenwashing around when companies say, buy our Earth Day um, collection. And we see that every year where companies come out with uh, you know, a collection that is made sustainable, but that only makes up about one or two percent of their total sales. And most of their sales that they put out are actually clothes that are made with a non with an, in a non mindful way that are usually made out of polyester, which is plastic that ends up as microplastics in the ocean, for example. So talking about the ways in which um, the climate crisis is used to deceive us as consumers is also very important and knowing how to uh, recognize that and call it out. And after all of those steps, um, I think that this diagram that was created by Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson really is a summary of what is the best way in which you can get involved, which is putting, you know, do this diagram on your own notebook and on the top circle, right? What brings you joy? Uh, for example, what brings me joy is to talk to people. What brings me joy is to uh, have, you know, interesting conversations, to share uh, my experiences and listen to other people's experiences. Uh, then this circle is what is the work that needs to be doing? What, what are some climate justice solutions? I think that a big part of climate justice solutions that we aren't focusing enough on is the issue of climate education, for example, or the issue of how to communicate science, how to communicate the intersectional nature of the climate crisis. And the other circle on the bottom left is what are you good at? Your special skills, networks, resources. So some people are good at writing, some people are good at taking pictures, some people are good at graphic design, some people are good at organizing. I think that I'm good at uh, organizing and also at public speaking. So that all brings me to what I should do. And if talking to people brings me joy, if the work that needs to be doing in part is climate education, and I'm good at public speaking, I'm gonna do things like this where I talk to young people about what we can do to address the climate crisis. And so uh, this is where my slides end and I think we have some Q&A, but um, I hope you found this helpful on your journey as an activist. And I hope we can, you know, that climate activism doesn't become a niche and doesn't stay a niche and a, a, a thing that only a few people do, but it's really something that we all do because at the end of the day, this is a defining issue of our lifetime. And we all have to be on the side of solutions. We all have to be on the side of optimism and on the side of believing that we can actually make the world a better place. Thank you so much, Shie. So I think Jenny is going to be navigating the questions. Um, Jen, is that correct? Absolutely. So if anyone has any questions at the bottom of your screen, you have a Q&A box. If you use that, that'll be the easiest way for us to um, find your questions. Sometimes in the chat box, they get lost. So if anyone has questions for Xie, please feel free to put them in the Q&A 
um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I have a question to get us started while they're thinking about their questions. Um, since um, I'm an educator, we're, many of us on the call uh, today are educators and or students, we're teaching or we're learning. Um, if you could name a few things that you wish you had learned in school, um, what would they be? What would have been useful to you? Um, I think that one thing that would be really useful is to just learn the science behind the climate crisis, because if you don't know how the greenhouse gas effect works, if you don't know that burning fossil fuels increases global temperature and you don't know that companies keep doing this despite knowing this, then it's hard to make the connection of what we need to target in terms of activism um, and what's actually you know, gonna have a, an impact. So I would definitely say learning the science, uh, you know, that little diagram with the earth and the sun and like the rays staying inside of the, of the atmosphere because they can't escape. So it gets warmer and warmer. When I first saw that, when I was like, you know, 15, I was mind blown that I hadn't learned it before and um, mind blown that I couldn't really explain it to people without going to the internet and finding myself and uh, learning it. So that's definitely one of them. All right, Shay, we do have a question. Um, and I think this brings a few questions for me. So we'll start with the question that we have. Um, what are some of the community level activities that you did with your school environmental club? We are, um, and the person shares, we are a group of middle schoolers and are looking for some ways to better educate our peers about the climate crisis and take action as a group. Yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, so community level activities to get people involved are um, very important. And I have a few. The first one is going to a community garden. Um, I think that going to a community garden is very nice in terms of hands-on, but you can also learn about um, the fact that there's a lot of communities that don't have access to a healthy, fresh food at all times, so they have to grow it themselves. Um, sorry, um, I'm kind of losing my voice again. <laughs> Another thing that um, you can do for community activities is to organize a Friday protest. And this is hard if you're a middle schooler because you need the approval of your parents. But if there is one day, it doesn't even have to be on a Friday or it can be after school where you can organize your club or you can organize um, you know, an approved trip with your teacher to go to city hall and have some posters and go out there in front of your representatives and say, you know, we care about climate solutions and find out what your specific county is doing or your specific um, city or specific district is doing with climate solutions or not. And write that down on posters and show up where people who make decisions are gonna be at. And the last one I would say um, is that, you know, there's a lot of organizations that organize trips to places like, uh, like Albany, where you can actually talk to politicians from the whole state. And they want young people to go because it's actually very impactful for these politicians to see that young people care. So organizing field trips to places like Albany where decisions are made, uh, going to, um, pro you know, organizing small protests and joining the global protests when there are, I think are very uh, good community um, activities that you can get involved in. Thank you for those examples. When you and Jamie were chatting earlier, you shared that you really felt like you as a student brought this conversation to your high school, that it was really you and peers that were bringing this urgent conversation. So for, for groups like this middle school group, um, you gave some examples of how they could influence policy and how they could influence their community. What about internally? What are some ways you think that they could educate their peers, support their school community for towards change? What are some things that you, you've seen work for yourself? Yeah, so um, usually I think that 
educating your own school is harder than trying to have an impact outside of your school. And that is because probably the people who care are already in that environmental club are, or are already trying to change something in the school. And so what really needs to happen is to build a sense of cohesion with the whole school. What my environmental club did is we created an Instagram page called Eco Beacon. That's the name of our high school, Beacon High School. And we just started posting about the things that we were doing as a club, about the activities that we were engaging in with, about the speakers that were going to come speak to our school. And all of these things got people you know, interested in what we were doing. And another really good tactic that we had was talking to other clubs and being able to come into those clubs and have a climate 101 where we taught other clubs about the climate crisis and how their club could help, um, you know, talk about it, educate their own uh, club members about it. And that's how you create, you know, you, but you have to be very specific about your goal. In this case, the goal was make sure that every single student in the school knows about the climate crisis. And you can have a twofold goal, which would be every single school, every single student in the school supports this policy or signs this policy. And if you want to change something within your school, you can make a petition so that every single student knows what the petition is, signs it, and maybe your school bans soft plastic, or maybe your school stops doing uh, single use um, dishes and starts doing, you know, reusable cutlery and, and reusable dishes. So I think that uh, it can start as small as making sure that everyone's educated and as big as changing an entire uh, system in, within your school. All right, we've got two more questions. So the next one is, why do you think students are not learning as much about the environmental crisis in schools as they should? Do you believe it's because teachers themselves are not sufficiently knowledgeable about climate issues or they don't have the time in their classes due to other educational requirements like regional, like uh, three through eight mandatory testing or regions exams? What are some of your thoughts about why it's not happening in schools? Well, I don't think teachers are to blame at all. I think that the, the school curriculum at the state level should include climate education. And it should uh, include it in, in science classes, in history classes. We don't learn about how much of the, um, of the things that happen in history have to do with climate uh, justice issues. For example, when farm workers were striking, they were striking because workers were exposed to pesticides and pollutants. And we don't learn about these things. We don't learn about the connections of historical things that have happened and how they connect to issues of climate justice. And this is because uh, for as much, many years we have been trying to change the current climate curriculum at a state level, and it hasn't happened because there's not enough push for it. So that's where we come in as students and we really say, this is what we wanna be taught. We wanna be taught um, not only what the climate crisis is, but what the solutions are and they, they can really be incorporated in many different classes. Um, but definitely uh, teachers can take that initiative. And I think that there's a lot of organizations that have like Climate 101 for teachers, like PowerPoints or presentations that they can share. And that definitely uh, involves the teacher knowing about the climate crisis in the first place, which is why there should be uh, courses for teachers on how to teach climate crisis and how to teach climate solutions. Um, because if they haven't learned it in school when they were in school, you know, it's hard to see how you are going to be a teacher and communicate it. So I think it can be, you know, pushed in many fronts, in the curriculum front, in the teacher front, but most importantly, just knowing that we're all in this learning process together. And we are, you know, we're going to get to a point where all of us are gonna know what our role is in Climate 101. Thank you for that. I just put for everyone in attendance, we were actually offering Climate 101 for educators on Yay. Thursday. <laughs> she didn't know we're doing that. So that's a good little plug. So that is in the chat if anyone wants to join us on this Thursday. Um, another question we have in the Q&A section is, can you share some of the successful strategies you have used 
to communicate with adults in decision-making positions such as school administrators? Well, there's many, but the main one is looking at your principal in the eyes and saying, I'm not skipping school because I don't care about school. I'm skipping school because nobody's doing enough for my future. And I don't really not, I don't really think that many adults have understood how scary that is for us, how scary it is that business as usual keeps happening uh, while we, the leaders of tomorrow, which is what they call us, are not being taught about the most important issue of our time and are not being given avenues to act upon the information that we do know if we get there. And so to communicate with school administrations in terms of strikes and in terms of new curriculum, it really has to be said very clearly that there is no other option, that we need to be teaching kids about climate solutions because that is what the whole world is gonna be about in five years time. Um, so it's our responsibility as, you know, as people who, as, well, not me, but like as educators for, for you to really be um, in that position. And it's the responsibility of students to make sure that we push for this. What you're saying, there's so many connections for me for what you're saying. There's such a huge social justice movement right now and the climate justice component of it you really don't hear as much in our schools. Yeah, so yeah. there really is a natural connection and a great sort of tipping point right now to make sure that this is a critical part of the conversations happening in schools. We have another question um, around climate deniers. Um, so this question is specifically about colleagues, educators who may be climate deniers, but I'm sure that you've faced climate deniers in lots of roles. So how have you, what have you seen that works uh, or have you seen anything that works when in, in, in conversation with someone who might be a climate denier? Well, the first thing to know, and this is not necessarily something you would say to a climate denier uh, as an opening step, but the first thing is that companies like Exxon have been funding climate denialism for you know, over 50 years when they found out that um, burning fossil fuels was gonna cause uh, climate change and global warming. And so it is mostly only a US phenomenon that there's climate deniers because this is a country where companies like Exxon were funding climate denialism. Um, so the way that I approach it is, okay, maybe because the science is very clear, uh, you know, rising um, fossil fuel burning equals rising temperatures equals destabilization. But if people don't wanna acknowledge that there is anthropocentric change, which means it's caused by humans, you can always tackle it through the pollution lens because nobody likes pollution. And so I say, what if we just create a better world by accident? even if there's not the problem, or, or even if that is not necessarily needed in your eyes? What if we stop polluting, stop contaminating water, stop contaminating air, stop destroying biodiversity, stop you know, mining uh, communities you know, with, with no regulations? What if on our way to building a better world, we actually achieve it? And I think that is the special thing about something that connects us all as humans is that we like a clean, healthy planet. And so that is, that is the way that I approach it. Maybe don't focus on saying climate change is real or climate change is not real. Focus on what the solutions that you're talking about are. The fact that those solutions include better education, education for more people, education about, um, about what your city can do to be less polluted, to be more energy efficient, you know? And there's so many avenues that you can approach it that do not ever include the words climate change. So I think that's like a way to, to uh, approach it. And in my school, for example, right now in university, I'm in a class where we teach middle schoolers about lead. So we don't go to the school and say, this is climate change 101. We say lead is a pollutant that is sometimes in buildings and can affect you personally. And there's regulations that have not been passed so that you are not exposed to lead. And that is the climate justice issue. Um, and you can frame it that way or you cannot, but the important thing is to know that 
there's so many different avenues as to where to get uh, through to the climate justice side with mentioning climate change. Thank you for those examples. I know that you have class coming up. So seeing no more questions, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then I'll turn it over to Jamie. Part of our intention for this week is to also, you know, make sure that those Climate 101 opportunities and conversations are happening, that educators and leaders know how they can impact their sphere of influence. But also we want people to, as they understand the urgency of this topic, we also want them to walk away with some hope. And so I'm also asking you, what, what's bringing you the most excitement? What, what brings you the most hope in this conversation as we continue to, to push this work and make sure that people understand how urgent it is? Well, what brings me hope is knowing that no movement has ever succeeded by thinking that it won't, which for me means that we have to keep going because we will succeed. And when you read history books, it says in 1992, this legislation was passed. In 93, this other thing happened. In 94, this other thing happened. Things don't happen from one day to another. They happen over the span of a couple, a few years. And so I am not discouraged by seeing that we are not moving as fast as we can. Just I am encouraged by knowing that we've never moved faster, that we've never known as much, that we are all including climate, um, into our conversations and hopeful by the fact that so many more people need to be taught about this. You know, there's 1 billion people that have never heard the words climate change around the world. And there is hope in the fact that every single person who learns about it is going to be an agent of change. And so that is really what my hope is, that everybody is going to rise up and, and realize that we all have something to bring, that because the climate crisis touches every single issue, all of us don't have to change our lives to be part of the solution. We just have to be conscious. We just have to change our mindset. And when we do that, we become part of the climate solution. Oh, goosebumps, yep. goosebumps, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Jamie, take it over. Oh, no, I just wanna say thank you so much. I want you to know, in case you don't know, that New Jersey has um, passed legislation for climate education standards across the disciplines, K-12. So. Um, we're hoping that they will be a leader. Um, and I also want to let you know that we will do everything we can as educators, as part of the center and the Cloud Institute and all the organizations that are involved. Um, this is our passion and our responsibility. And so we will be working on it uh, with you and, and all the other youth leaders and young people. So thank you so much for making the time for us today. And um, we'll make sure as many classrooms as possible get to see this video and we'll see you down the road. Thank you for having me. And thank you everyone for watching and attending. <laughs>